So, of course, Thursday nights we're going through the book of Matthew, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And tonight we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> and we'll get right into it. The Bible reads, Matthew chapter 11, and verse 1, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. And one of the great things I like, just starting right out of the gate here about this chapter, this first verse just shows us that Jesus was somebody who led by example. He wasn't just somebody that said, hey, go do this, and but didn't do it himself. He was somebody who you know, commanded his disciples to go do something, and what was it that he commanded them? If you remember from last week in Matthew chapter 10, if you just look at verse 5 and 4, what was it that he commanded them to do? He said, these 12 Jesus sent forth, they commanded them, so, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and any of the cities of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus had commanded his disciples, saying, hey, you need to go and preach the gospel. That's what he commanded them to do. But here then we see in, in uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, that when he had made an end of commanding his disciples, he himself departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. He did what he told others to do. And, you know, that's a great example that anybody who's in leadership, whether it's, you know, behind a pulpit or in a church, or, you know, especially even in our own homes as men that are raising families, that we need to take, uh, you know, not just say one thing and do another, but we actually need to, you know, yes, command. Yes, say, hey, these are how things are going to be done. This is what I expect, but then also demonstrate that. You know, we want to show them how to do things. Uh, you, you know, and that's, that's a great thing to look for in a church and in a pastor. You know, and, I, and this is something that we've run into. A lot of people have run into this, where they have a, the, a, a pastor that says, yeah, I'm all for soul winning. That's great if you want to do it. They're, I mean, maybe they don't even necessarily have a, a dedicated time in the week and the schedule where the church goes out as a body and preaches the gospel door to door, house to house, as we see in the scripture. But, you know, uh, well, there's a lot of churches out there like that, you know, even independent fundamental Baptist churches. And, but the thing is, there's a lot of people that come into churches like that and they want to do soul winning. You know, they want to go out and they want to knock doors. They want to go out and reach the community and preach the gospel to others. And the pastor will say, yeah, that's fine, that's great, I'm all for that, go ahead and do that. And he'll, and, but he'll let them go, but he won't, himself will not go and do that. He'll prove of it, he'll say, yeah, it's something we should be doing, but he doesn't go. Or sometimes they'll have pastors, and this does happen, where they'll say, you know what, it's not for me to go, my, my, my job is just to send you. That's, that's ridiculous. That's not the example of Christ. Jesus Christ, not only did he command disciples to go and to preach, but he himself went and preached. So that's one of the first things, you know, we're only in verse 1, and we've already got, you know, the makings of a great sermon right there. I mean, that could be a whole sermon in of itself of just leading by example. You know, as men in the home, you know, as wives to their children, you know, this is an important one to those of you that are raising children. That, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to just do it yourself, you know, and to just have the kids, you know, try to learn from that. But sometimes you actually have to take time and show them how to do something. You have to... You know, not just hurry up and, well, you know, it's easier for me to just do it and, and not teach you and just get it done. I've got a million things that I have to do. I get that. That's not easy. But sometimes there comes a time where the, if you ever want those kids to be a help and a blessing, that you're going to have to stop and show them, you know, this is how you do laundry. This is how you do dishes. This is how you do, you know, mow the lawn. This is how you take out the trash. You know, kids have to be taught all these things. So it's very important that, you know, we, 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 uh, we set the example that we teach, that we, that we command and do all that. Not just command and teach and show and tell, but that we also do. We go out and live that example. The Bible says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving Amen. your own selves. You know, we need to do the word. Not just hear it, but we need to do it. So we'll keep moving along here, though. Because there's just a lot of great stuff in this chapter, but that's just a, a quick point right there. But the Bible goes on and says in uh, John, or Matthew, excuse me, Matthew chapter 11, verse 2, where it says, now when... And now when John had heard in the, in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Now, you know, sometimes you read things about like this that happen to, to men of God in the Bible, and you think, man, that's kind of a shame. I mean, John here is already in prison, you know, because of, of what he had said to uh, Herodias, uh, Herodias um, you know, calling him out for his, his uh, marrying his, his brother's sister, saying it's not lawful for thee to have her. You know, he ends up in jail for that. You know, it's an unfortunate, but you know, that's, that's the stand that he took. He was willing to preach the, the, the precepts of God, and, and it cost him his freedom. But, you know, when he's here in prison, what we can learn from this, as it says there in verse 3, he says, uh, He sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? I mean, that's amazing to me to sit here and think. I mean, this is John the Baptist doubting whether or not Christ was Christ, whether he was the Messiah. 
I mean, that's really amazing when you stop and think about who John the Baptist was. I mean, he was the one that, you know, was, was prophesied about, that was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb when he was yeah. by Elizabeth. Then he went out into the wilderness and he fed, you know, ate wild honey and locusts. And he was, you know, gird with camel's hair to the day of the showing of Christ. I mean, he was the one that was sent to prepare the way before Christ. He's the one that said, I'm not worthy to bow down and, and uh, unlatch his, his, his shoe. And he was the one that baptized Jesus. And he saw the heavens open, the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. I mean, he saw all these things, amazing things. Great man of God, yet here we find him in prison, doubting. I mean, that should be a lesson to any of us that, you know, if John the Baptist can doubt from time to time, you know, it's just part of human nature that we ourselves will sometimes doubt. You know, especially when we get into these certain, you know, specific circumstances. I mean, it's easy to not doubt when everything's going great. You know, when you're like, oh, God's blessing me, everything's going great in my life, I any problems. But when you run into circumstances, maybe you start that are a little more difficult, you run into trouble, you start to think, is God real? Does God really even care? Am I, why am I even trying to live this life? Why am I even doing this? You know, why am I, do I, do I really believe this? Is God real? You start, you could start to doubt in your own mind. And a lot of people, sometimes they really beat themselves up over that, you know, and they, and they doubt. And I believe everybody probably at some point in their life, you know, after they've gotten saved, after they've put their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation alone, that they've, uh, they probably experienced doubt and wondered, are they, are we, am I really saved and things like that? Now, I think a lot of times just when somebody doubts their salvation, I've had a few people come to me and say, you know, I don't know if I'm saved. I wonder if I'm saved. And usually the fact that you're wondering whether or not you're saved is usually a pretty indication that you are saved. Because I don't think unsaved people go through life wondering, am I saved? They don't, they don't think about the things of God. They don't care about the things of God. It's usually the person who's saved that wonders whether or not they're saved. So usually to me, that's one of the things I first say is, hey, you know, the fact that you're even sensitive about this, the fact that you would even bother you, tells me that you probably are saved. You know, what do we have to do to be saved? You know, what we, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I think sometimes we doubt because we sometimes think, is it really that easy? Is it really that simple? Well, the good news is that it is. That it is that easy. That it's all by grace through faith. That it's not of works, lest any man should boast. That the only thing we have to do is believe. So sometimes we just need to be reminded, I think, sometimes of, of, of how simple salvation is. And that sometimes could be a great assurance. But really the greatest place to get assurance of your salvation, if you are ever in doubt, is from the Word of God. You know, you can come and talk to, uh, you know, somebody else, a brother or sister in Christ about it. You know, but they're, if they're any kind of help or counsel, they're going to direct you back to the Word of God. And that's exactly what we see happening here with John the Baptist. He sends two of his disciples to Christ to ask, hey, are you, are, are you him or do we look for another? And, and, of course, they bring back the words of Jesus, right? And they, and they preach to him again these things. So, really, if you are doubting it, you know, there, there are some great passages that we could turn to. And go ahead and just keep something in Matthew 11. But if you would, turn over to... Uh, Turn over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. While you're going to Romans 8, I'm going to read to you some verses from John. And really, the book of John itself is probably the best book to, to you know, uh, work on the subject of assuring your salvation. If you're ever in doubt of whether or not you're saved, you know, going to the book of John is a great place to remind you. Because the book of John is just all about how it's all by belief. You know, these things are written that you might believe. That's why the book of John was even written. The Bible says, and you're going to Romans 8, but it says in John 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That's present tense. Amen. And it's everlasting, meaning it never will end. Meaning that once you receive eternal life, it's yours forever. You can't lose it because Amen. it's a gift. Amen. You know, you don't work for a gift to get it, but at the same time, you don't work for a gift to keep it. You know, salvation is a free gift. It's not something that we work for. He says that you hath everlasting life, and that you shall not come into condemnation. He didn't say you might come into condemnation. He didn't say there's a chance. It's a possibility that we could screw it up and somehow end up in condemnation. No, he says that once you have everlasting life, you shall not come into condemnation, and that you are actually passed from death unto life. Amen. You passed over it. So that's a great, one of those great verses. Another one that comes to mind, we think about great verses about eternal security and how that once we're saved, we're always saved, is John 10:27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Again, salvation over and over again is a gift. It's something that's given to us. That neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, that would include anybody, including yourself. Any man could pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. 
You know, I used to hear a preacher preach this at uh, like a like a junior church setting, and he would he would challenge you take a piece of candy, and he would say, if there's any kid who come up here and pry my hand open, he can have the candy. And he'd have six, seven kids hanging off of his arm trying to get that candy out. You know, and he was this big burly dude. They couldn't get up. They would never get his hand open. And not without getting really malicious, you know, they'd have to get pretty sneaky about it, right? But he was just trying to illustrate. I mean, that's kind of the picture of us, you know. If somebody, if we're trying to pry eternal life out of God's hand, it would be as foolish as that. As thinking of some, you know, three, four-year-old could come up to a grown man and pry open his clenched fist. It'd be something similar to that. Probably that's just like a, a small picture. It'd be much, it'd be much more uh, magnified even more than that. But here there in Romans 8, this is another great verse to assure us of our salvation. The Bible says in Romans 8, chapter verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying in the beginning here about how a person who doubts their salvation, it's, you know, that's probably a sign that you're saved right there. I mean, the fact that maybe the Spirit's trying to convince you maybe some other things in your life, maybe you're doubting. Because I think people, a lot of times when we find ourselves doubting in self, uh, our salvation, is when there's some kind of sin in our life. You know, we wonder, we've gotten backslidden, we've gotten away from the Lord, we're like, man, I'm saved, how can I even be doing this? And maybe God's kind of working on us and trying to bring us back. What is he doing? It's the Spirit trying to lead us again. He's trying to lead us back to God, lead us back into living, not necessarily to salvation, because, again, that's a one-time event, but he's just trying to get us back on the right path with God Amen. so that we don't have to be chasing. The Bible goes on and says there in verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So at the end of the day, it's the spirit that's going to bear witness with your spirit. I mean, I can get up here and quote all the verses that I can, and hopefully God can use those, and you can read the scripture. And, and But you have to understand that if you're saved, you're born again, I, I absolutely believe that if you go to the word of God and ask God to lead you and guide you in this matter of whether or not you're really saved, you know, if you're really saved, the Spirit is going to bear witness with your spirit and give you that assurance. You know, there's been, there's been a time or two in my life where I've doubted my salvation. And, you know, it's amazing how God assures me of those things. And, you know, it was always through the Word of God, you know, and, and, and let me rest assured that, that I'm God's child and that can never change. Amen. Now, another way, and I don't recommend, this is another way to find out whether or not you're saved. This isn't something you want to do, but sometimes, like I said, a lot of times people doubt because they are in a backslidden state. You know, if you're in a doubting, if you're kind of in a backslidden state, you need to just look for evidence of God's chastening. You know, that, that was a big one. I know I can think back to seasons in my life where I wasn't right with God, and I can say, well, there was God's chastening there, there was God's chastening there, there was God's chastening there. You know, my, this was out of order, my health was bad, my finances were bad, life wasn't going good, things were hard. What was that? That was God chasing me. And, if, and you know, that's, a, that's a, an assurance of your salvation right there that God is dealing with you as he would sons. The Bible says, I'll read to you from Hebrews chapter 12, you have not re resisted, uh, you have not yet resisted in the blood striving against sin, and he forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So a great way to be assured of our salvation is that, you know, if we're born again, if we're God's child, because we're not perfect, there is going to be some kind of chastening along the way, especially if we get into that backslidden state where we, you know, we're, we're back in sin, we're not right with God, we're not living for the Lord, you know, it, you will probably experience the chastening hand of God. And that in and of itself is... You know, uh, uh, a, the spirit bearing witness with us, if you will, when God is chastening his child. The Bible, it goes on and says, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, you are bastards and not sons. Yeah. So here's the thing. If you could go out and live a life of sin and never experience God's chastening, and a lot of people do this, don't they? A lot of the people, wicked people go out and they live wicked lives and they get involved in the worst kinds of sin and it seems like they're just getting away with it and getting away with it and getting away with it and that nothing ever bad happens. Life is going good. And, you know, and, and, but, it's, but here's the thing. They're not God's children. That, and it seems like they're getting away with it here, but their punishment comes later, you know, at the end of this life. And it's far worse than anything we as God's children are going to experience here on this earth. You know, so that's that's something to keep in mind that, you know, and really what is that when we when we see God letting the wicked get away with things? 
It's really the long suffering on God of God on their behalf. You know, wanting, you know, giving them chance and, and the time to repent and to believe on Christ, you know, and and, uh, and and all of that. But so another good way to see if you're God's child is to look for his chastening hand. Now again, you know, if you're right with God, stay right with God. Don't go out and live a life of sin and say, Oh, I'm just seeing if I'm really God's child. I'm really I'm just going out to see if God will chase me so I can just assure myself of salvation, right? That's kind of a silly thing to do. But we'll go ahead and move on here in uh, Matthew. Go ahead and go back to Matthew. We're going to move, start pick it back up in Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> so these, uh, these disciples come to, jo- to Jesus from John the Baptist. And what does he answer? He answers them here in John four, or Matthew, 4, Matthew 11, verse 4. Excuse me. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and show again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, I know I mentioned this, I think, in a sermon just this last Sunday, or maybe it was last Thursday, but I can never go by that verse without pointing out how amazing that is. That you see all these, you know, and I won't spend time, because I know, I, I think most here have already heard me just preach on this, but you look at verse 5, it's just these lists of miracles, right? The blind, they're seeing the sight, the lame walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up. I mean, these are great, huge, mighty miracles that Christ did. And what's the last one that he mentioned? And the poor have the gospel preached to them. You know, preaching the gospel to the poor is in the same same list of these great works that Christ did. I mean, when we go out and we preach the gospel to somebody and they get saved, that's a miracle. And we should never lose sight of that. So every time I come across this this verse, I'm going to go ahead and ring that bell. But we'll move along here because I know I just preached on it. And it goes on and says in verse 6, And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, that's an important verse. That's something that we have to keep in mind, especially if we're going to, you know, try to live a biblical life with, with standards and, and have some, uh, you know, integrity in our walk with Christ and take certain stands, especially in the world that we're living in today where, where there, it's becoming much more hostile towards the things of God, much more hostile towards Christianity. You know, he's kind of he's kind of saying this to John. Hey, John, don't be offended in me, you know, because... He doesn't want. He wants them to be blessed, right? But it's the same thing with us that we should not be offended in Christ. You know that we should never be offended and think, well, I don't know if we should really be doing this. And I'll tell you what: if you if you're either a part of a good church or you're somebody who preaches the word of God, and you and you're in somebody or you are associated with somebody who where where the whole word counsel of God is preached, I'm I'm telling you, it's only a matter of time before an offense comes. It's only a matter of time becomes to you because we're all sinners. You know, you know, it's we love hard preaching until it falls in our lap, until it's something that got, until the preacher gets on our sin. You know, and if the preacher is preaching the whole counsel of the Word of God, it's only a matter of time. He doesn't have to sit there and try and figure out what you're involved in or what your sins are. He doesn't have to and, and then write a sermon just for you. No, you, no, no one has to do that. If we just preach the Word of God, you know, eventually it's going to fall on somebody. And it's going to apply somewhere. A lot of times I'm preaching it, it's falling right here. You know, these are things that I meditate and think about throughout the week and things that I have to work on and stuff like that. But not only that, so not only will it fall on you in the pew, but it also might, you know, there might be an opportunity for you to become offended in when, when the world begins to attack a man of God, when the world begins to attack a church. Now, we've seen that. We've seen that at Faithful Word. We've seen that at other churches. You know, several times where somebody has gotten up and preached something that they, that the world considers controversial, they say we don't agree with that. You know, we, we think of the, the stance here that we have on on the homos, right? That they're reprobate, Amen. and that that the Bible condemns that with the death penalty, and that's biblical. Leviticus Amen. twenty thirteen. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. And the world today, that's not a popular message with the world at all. I mean, they're all for, you know, they want to convince you that these, there's nothing wrong with these people, that they're great, that they're loving and they're kind. You know, you go read Romans 1. Go read the book of Jude. Go read these things about what, the, what these people are like. And that's what the truth is in the Bible. But the point I'm trying to make, I don't want to go into all that, is that things like that will cause an offense. And will cause the world to attack. And we inside the house of God, we that are under that kind of preaching, that there's uh, there's a potential there's a possibility that we ourselves will become offended over that to say well I don't want to be associated with that preacher I don't want to be associated with that part of the Word of God that's not me you know I, I I don't want anything to do with that because they don't want they don't want the offense they don't want the world to say well well you're one of them too you know they're like Peter I know not the man yeah. you know and begin to curse and, and, and go out and, and and you know they're afraid of the, the little maid who's on, on CNN is going to come after him or something you know. <laughs> 
And you think this never happens, but I can tell you it's going on right now. And it's, it's almost kind of funny. I, pre, I put this clip, I, one of the, my uh, things that I do as a deacon is I go through Pastor Anderson's old sermons. And I'll listen to old sermons and I'll make clips. And about a month ago, I went through a sermon called Old Fashioned. And he was just talking about how, how you know, there's things that we believe that are considered old fashioned and how a lot of them are contrary to the world's philosophy today. And one of those things is that women are to be keepers at home. That's what the Bible says. Amen. That they are to keep the home, that they are to be good, to be obedient to their own husbands. The Bible says that if you suffer not a woman to teach, nor you usurp authority over a man. So I made a little clip where he kind of preached on that, where he touched on that. And I'm telling you that then this, uh, and it went by for a month. It was quiet. Not, I didn't hear a peep about it. I, I made several clips. I mean, I thought, I didn't think anything of that. Well, you never know which one's going to trigger people. But then this uh, website or this Facebook page called Occupy Democrats. You know, everyone, I think every once in a while, these people are hurting for a good news story. They just go over to Pastor Anderson's uh, you know, YouTube account and kind of say, What's, what can we find that's, that'll offend all of our you know, snowflake millennial uh, voter types and we can get them all out and riled up. And boy, they found that one. And I'm telling you, I could take that, I could take that phone and take you to the, the church's message because I have access as an admin to the church's Facebook page and show you the messages that we've been getting from people over that clip. And that clip was mild. I mean, that clip was, I mean, it's radical to some people, but I mean, it's, it's, it's all Bible, Amen. what he says in that, in that, in that clip. And uh, it just triggered these people. And I mean, there's things that have been messaged to the church that I couldn't repeat in mixed company. It's vulgar, it's vile, and it's been going on for days. It's been going on for days. I had to turn off the notifications on it because every time I, I would get on Facebook, we'd be like, you have 20 new messages, and it's just like, how dare you? You're this, bleepity bleep, blah, blah, blah. And it's just person after person after person is just triggered. You know, and so that, that's a real mild form of, of persecution. You know, that's, that's pretty mild. But what about when the protesters show up? What about when you do finally, you know, preach a hard sermon against the homos or whoever, and, you know, 100 protesters show up out your front door? Has that ever happened? That's happened. You know, go to Verity Baptist Church in, in Sacramento, California, where they had like 800 in one day of people. I was there for that. That's intense. When you've got people out there screaming and yelling, and if they had their way, they would come in that place and tear you to shreds and burn the place down if they could. They're that mad about what you, what you said. And all you said was what the Bible says. Amen. And so we have to determine in our hearts and in our minds right now, are we going to be offended in Christ or not? Is if we're going to be a part of a church where the whole Bible is preached, the world's going to get offended, and, and, it, and if, if that's too much for us to handle, you know, that's going to push us right out the door. And I've seen that happen firsthand, but I don't want to spend all night on that either. So let's move along here. It says there in verse 7, And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold they, behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And that's a really good question that Jesus asked there. He says, what were you going to see? What was it that you went to see when you went to see this man of God? What were you expecting? What did you want? What were you expecting to see? A lot of people today, they go into churches with an expectation and, and they want a certain something from the man of God. They want a certain something from the prophet. They want the preacher to be a certain way, right? And what is it that most people want today? They want a preacher who's going to get up and just kind of scratch their back and rub their ears. They have itching ears, just itch their ears, make, tell them that God's not mad at you, that, that hell is cold and that there's nothing wrong with sin and that it's okay to do this and it's okay to do that. And that it's just love, 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 grace, grace, grace. You know, it's, it's a 52-part, it's a uh, you know, series on the love of God. You know, it's 52 weeks long. It's every Sunday. You know, every sermon is just the love of God, the love of God. Now, don't get me wrong. The love of God is great. Amen. Yes. And we love the love of God. You know, for God so loved the world. We preach that, you know, several times a week out to the lost. Amen. We go door to door and say, hey, you know, God loves you. He died for you. Was buried and rose again. But here in the house of God, there's a lot more to preach than just the love of God. Yeah. You know, there's certain things, standards, things that we have to preach on. We have to preach against sin to get the sin of our life and prophecy and doctrine. There's a lot of things that we have, as God's people have to understand. 
So when we go to the house of God, what is it that we're expecting? Are we expecting just somebody who's just going to tell us that, that everything we want to hear? Or are we trying to learn something new or maybe receive something that might be a little bit hard and challenge us spiritually? Amen. And a lot of people, they don't want to go and see what would be considered a hard preacher. You know, somebody who preaches a hard message you know, who doesn't hold back, who preaches the whole council and just lets it fly and, and lets it land where it might. You know, people can, can like it or lump it. But what, what is it that people expect today? Is that, is that what most people are looking for, the hard preacher, the face-ripping preacher? Is that what they want? Well, that, there's plenty of evidence that, that, that no, that's not what they want. What they want is Joel Olstein. They want the nice hair, the pretty smile, <laughs> got the soft voice. He wanted to come out from the pulpit with his, his little microphone, and he wants the team with the wife up there, and they're just going to talk about marriage and all these wonderful things. Now, there's a place to talk about marriage. That's an important thing. But they want, they don't want, Joel, you think Joel Osteen's going to get up and rip face? I don't even think the guy has, has it in him. You know, he doesn't have that in him to get up and, 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 tear, and tear it up and, and bring the place down. And, you know, but that's what people want, isn't it? And that's evidenced by the fact that that guy is preaching to tens of thousands of people on a regular basis. And there's many more like him. You know, there's many more people out there that will gladly hear the nice, soft, smooth sayings from the man of God. Well, Jesus is saying here, what were you expecting when he went out to see John the Baptist? Now, what kind of man was John the Baptist? Well, he was a hard preacher. Amen. He was somebody that did not hold back. And proof of that is a, we already went through it, but go back to Matthew chapter 3. Let's remind ourselves again of the kind of preacher that John the Baptist was. Was he more of a Joel Olstein type? Was he more of one that would, you know, you say, you know, uh, I, I, I can't call that a sin necessarily. And, you know, that's not my place to judge you. You know, that's not at all what John the Baptist was. And if you look here at Matthew chapter 3, look at verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, Oh, God wants your best life now. <laughs> you know, 40 days of grace for you guys. Let's get in a small group and, and talk about the love of God. No, he says, what does he say here? He says, when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, Oh, generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. I mean, I'm sure he said it much more emphatically than I just did, you know, in front of him. And it wasn't just them. He, he rebuked them publicly, and, he, and he, he challenges them there. You know, he calls them vipers. You know, he calls them, you know, that they're, who with warning to flee from the wrath, he's saying, you're damned. You know, you're, you're, you're appointed unto wrath, you know, and he's, rip, you know, he's, he's ripping face on these guys. So what was it that these people went out for to see? A man clothed with soft raiment? Well, what did he wear? He wore, you know, he wore a camel, he was girded with, about with leather and camel's hair. You know, not exactly the, the finest, you know, uh, garments around. He wasn't in high fashion, I'm sure. You know, it's probably not the most comfortable thing to wear on the desert. But he was a man of God. He was much more than a prophet, Jesus said. So he was a hard preacher. And even Jesus himself, if you recall, go over to Matthew chapter 16, he'll say, you say, oh, that's John. You know, that was John. He was supposed to preach like that, but Jesus was different. You know, Jesus was just all love, love, love. Never, never preached hard against anything. That's not true either. <coughs> Jesus himself called them vipers. He called them uh, a den of thieves. You know, he called them whited sepulchers. You know, Jesus didn't hold back either. And he called people names. You know, and there's a time and place for the man of God to get up and call people names. If that's what they are. You know, the wicked need to be pointed out as being wicked Amen. and called out. The Bible says here in Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 13. And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they some said, Thou art, thou art, uh, they think you're Joel Osteen. You know, they think you're uh, Kenneth Copeland. They think you're one of these nice preachers. No, they said they think you're John the Baptist. Now, why would they have mistaken him for John the Baptist? Well, it wasn't because of the way he looked. It was because of the way he preached. Uh -huh. And they said, boy, you know, the way you preach, they, they think you're John the Baptist or some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the, or one of the prophets. You know, if, if you don't think that, that hard preaching, that a, a prophet getting up and telling it like it is, is God's way, I challenge you to go just open up any book in the Old Testament. Go read Isaiah. Go read, you know, uh, uh, Ezekiel. Go read any of them. Go read any of these Old Testament prophets, and it's just... I mean, they liken them on you. They say, Jeremiah, go read Jeremiah. I mean, that, that's some hard preaching. 
that's harder preaching than I've ever heard that's done in the Word of God. And uh, I want to just take a minute and kind of remind us again of some of these people that Jesus himself was mistaken for. And if you would, go ahead and turn over to uh, 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. Because when was the first one? They said John the Baptist, right? They think you're John the Baptist. And we already saw what John the Baptist preached, what his preaching was. And they say, but some Elias. So what kind of preacher was Elias? You know, of course, that's the New Testament uh, translation of, of uh, Elijah there. And it says in 1 Kings 18, verse 17, I'll begin reading in verse 17, 1 Kings 18, 17. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house. And then he had forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam. So right away we see that Elijah was the kind of guy that wasn't afraid to call out leadership. Ahab was the leader then, and he was, uh, you know, he was the one in authority, and he was the king. But that didn't stop Elijah from calling out and saying, you know, you're the problem, buddy. And he called out the leaders of his day for their wickedness, for following Balaam. You know, and it's the, it's the, it's the place of the man of God to get up and call out wicked leadership. And that's, you know, it should surprise us if it happens today when we have wicked rulers that are ruling the country for a man to get up behind a pulpit and say they're wicked. It shouldn't surprise us. We shouldn't be offended by that. Amen. That's what they thought Jesus was like. And they are comparing him to Elijah. He goes on and says there in verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all the Israel, unto Israel, all, unto Mount Carmel, all the prophets of Baal, 450, and prophets of the grove, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So he's saying, get all the false prophets together. We're going to have a little showdown. If you know the story, you know, he challenges them to, you know, call down fire from heaven. And the prophets of Baal, they cut themselves from morning until noon, and they call upon God, upon their false god, and they're crying and weeping and making a big show but the fire never comes and of course Elijah gets up and in just like a few words like just a sentence calls down fire from heaven consumes the the, the ox consumes the, the, the even the, the the altar itself right and the Bible says there in, in verse 21 and Elijah came unto all the people and said how long halt ye be two two opinions so here he is preaching at the people Saying, hey, you guys need to get right with God. That's what he's doing. That's the kind of preacher he was. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. You know, it's the man of God's place to get up and draw a line in the sand. And say, you need to decide where you stand on this issue. Where you stand on the word of God. If you're over here, be over here. If you're over here, be over here. But don't be one of these people that's always straddling the fence. You know, not really sure where to stand. Trying to play both sides. And the man of God gets up and he draws a line in the sand. And he says, you need to decide where you stand. And the people answered him not a word. In verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the book Krishon and slew them there. So, I mean, this is an intense guy. I mean, he calls down fire from heaven. The people get right with God. And you think he would just say, well, my work here is done. Oh, no. He was not done. He says, go get all those guys that have been deceiving everybody. Get everybody that's been preaching these false, has, called, has brought my people away from the true Lord God and caused them to worship devils. Call them to worship a false God. Go get those guys. Take them down to the river. And, and he didn't have anybody else. It says that, and he slew them there. And he himself went and slew those prophets. Killed them. Wow. That's an intense preacher. Now, I'm not saying that's the man of God's place today. You have nothing to worry about. <laughs> you know, there's not going to be that going on in here. But I'm just trying to show us that these are the type of people that Jesus was being compared to. That he was being mistaken for. You know, we could go to Jeremiah. I won't take the time because I'm kind of already spending a lot of time on this point. But all of God's prophets were unpopular preachers. That's another thing to take note of. They were not popular. They were not lauded. They were not praised. They were not lifted up by the world. You know, Billy Graham's got his 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 you know his uh his footprints in the in the what is it the, the Walk of Fame or whatever New York. He's got his star. That's never going to happen with these guys. You're never going to see that the world lift him up. The Bible, Jesus said, "You know, woe to you, and the world shall speak well of you." For so did the pro their uh, their fathers uh, of the false prophets. Amen. He said, the, "The the false prophets are the ones that are lifted up by the world." and extolled and, and praised and, and, and are very popular. But it says, you know, when we look in the Word of God, it's, it's the real men of God are not the popular ones. They're, you know, the most powerful men of God are probably people we've never even heard of. 
and never will hear of until, until glory. And there's a lot of other things that we could turn, a lot of other different passages where we could read some hard preaching by, by every, any one of the prophets. And they say, and that's why I said unto them at the end, who said that I am? Or one of the prophets. I mean, pick one. Pick any one of the prophets out of the Old Testament. And you know what? It's the same type of preaching in the Old Testament that you see Jesus doing. Hard preaching, drawing a line in the sand, calling out wickedness, calling a spade a spade, telling it like it is. And that's the kind of preaching that we should want today as well. Amen. Now go on in there, in, uh, back to Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 11. We'll continue on here. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, what's he saying? What does he mean by this? This seems like one of those kind of cryptic things, and I've thought about this over the years and thought, what exactly does that mean? Well, you know, sometimes I think we overthink things. I think it's actually pretty simple what he's saying here. I think what he's saying here is that, it's, you know, this is just kind of, maybe there's different ways you can look at this, different ways to interpret this or apply this verse. But really, one thing we can for sure take away from this is the fact that it's better to be in heaven than anywhere else. He's saying, look, John the Baptist is a great guy. You know, there hasn't been a, 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 more, a greater man born among women than him. But nevertheless, he that is in heaven is greater than he. You know, it's better to be in heaven than to be here. And a lot of times people kind of get caught up with, you know, who's going to be the greatest? You know, how can we be great here on earth? You know, well, you're not going to be John the Baptist, one. You know, Jesus said you're not going to. Yeah. So that, that position's taken, so no bother. But the point is, I mean, it's better to be in heaven anyway. And I kind of touched about this uh, a, a while back again, a few sermons ago too, where the, where the disciples that came back in Luke 10, I'll just remind us real quick, where they come back because, and they were astonished because the spirits uh, were subject unto them. They were able to cast out devils. And, and Jesus says, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. He says, don't rejoice in the fact that you have power over, over the devils and unclean spirits. He says that the spirit, you know, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen, amen. You know, that's something to rejoice about. You know, that's something to get excited about, is the fact that, you know, greater, if we want to be great, the, the greatest person is in heaven. That's the greatest place to be. So really, and this whole idea, go ahead and turn over to Mark chapter 9, of trying to be the greatest, you know, trying to out-Christian the Christian, trying to out-soul win the other soul winners, trying to memorize more Bible just because, so you can say you did. Or just try to be the best. Now, I'm all, I'm all for people trying to do their best and excel in areas. I'm not saying that. But if you have the wrong motive, if your motive is just so that you can kind of feel like you're really something or just say, hey, I'm, I'm better than so-and-so, if you kind of one-up somebody else, you know, that's, that's a very vain endeavor. That's a very shallow thing. That's not something that we should uh, want to be part of our, uh, our, our attitude. And look there, and, and that's something people get caught up in. I mean, we're going to see it right here in Mark chapter 9. Look at verse 33, and he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, what, what was it that you disputed among yourselves among the, by the way? Now, I love how it says this, but they held their peace. It's like it's just like when a parent catches their kid, and they finally decide to call him on it. You know, the kid thinks they get away with it for a little while, and he says, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, why don't you explain to me what you were doing earlier? What, what do you mean by that? You know, like, like the... the the kid gets the cookie, you know, they, they got away, they got the chocolate all over their face. <laughs> the parent's just like, you idiot. You know, and the kid's like, ah, I got away with it. Yeah, I'm going to go play with my Legos now or something. The mom says, hey, come in here. You know, how is it that chocolate got on your face? What chocolate, you know? It's just like, a, that's what it reminds me of. It's just like, Jesus knows their thoughts. He knows their hearts, and they help they answer him out of peace. Like, he just busts them here. He says, uh, you know, of what was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way but they held their peace for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest I mean what a, what a stupid conversation what a stupid argument to have well who's going to be greater you know which one of the twelve I mean but that's the kind of thing we can get caught up in you know especially if we're if we are trying to be spiritual I mean these guys were the twelve I mean they were the close to God I mean you can kind of see how they might get lifted up a little bit like hey yeah well, we're the ones who Jesus picked out we're you know and he was they were you know they were the ones that that Jesus picked out. They were special. But I think they kind of let it go to their heads. You know, we ought to be careful not to get that same attitude about who's going to be the greatest or think that we're better than somebody else. And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. 
You know, whosoever shall be greatest among you shall be the servant. You know, and that kind of seems like a paradox, you know. But if you're going to be the greatest, then you have to be the servant. You know, and, and would we really look at the servant and say, that guy's the greatest? No, we probably wouldn't. I mean, you wouldn't look at the guy who goes in and, and you know, cleans the bathrooms in the White House or something like that as the greatest. But you know what? That's kind of how it is in God's kingdom. You know, it's the guy that's doing all the menial tasks, all the things that, that are going unseen that help things go along and, and the things that other people would say, well, that's unimportant. But if we have that kind of an attitude, if we have that kind of a mentality of where we want to serve others, then that's what's going to make us great in God's sight. You know, that's why going out soul winning, you know, and that's something that's just going to constantly come across this pulpit is soul winning. And, you know, I hope we never get dull of hearing it because it's so important. And we go out and go soul winning. What are we doing when we do that? We're serving others. I mean, think about it. We're going into, into neighborhoods where sometimes people don't even appreciate you. They don't, they don't care that you're there. They just want to eat dinner and be left alone. But to other people, they, you know, they, they stop and listen. But, you know, we're taking time out of our day. You know, I'm not at home eating dinner. You know, I'm not, I have to walk through your neighborhood and smell the barbecue. It, it drives me nuts. You know, I'm going to say, can you put that out, please? You know, I'm, I'm trying to serve God here. And you're interrupting. You're making me carnal. But that's the, that's, the, that's the thing, though. If we really want to be great, if we want to be, God to reward us in heaven, well, we have to serve here. You know, we have to be willing to humble ourselves and give of ourselves and give of our time and our energy and ability. And we might go unappreciated here on earth, but, you know, the, the we'll have rewards in heaven. Amen. The greatest on earth, here's the thing. That's why it's a dumb argument to sit there and say, well, who's the greatest? You know, who among us is the greatest? The greatest person on, on earth that ever lived, I mean, you could say it was John the Baptist, but outside of that, you, we'll never know who it is. Not until we get to heaven. The greatest on earth will probably be known. It's probably some guy that lived way back when, or maybe it's some guy or some lady that's going to live way in the future, and we'll never know who it is because they're just going to be a servant. They're going to be somebody that did things out of a pure heart, out of a right heart, and just loved God, and God looked down and blessed them, and, and we'll find out in heaven. But that, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that either. I kind of already... We're running out of time here, so let's move along into uh, back Matthew chapter 11. Because this is another one of those kind of trickier verses where it says in verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And again, this is one of those ones that I think people overthink. And we just go, man, what does that mean? And, and maybe there are some deeper applications here. But I think if we're just, you know, just going over it here in a, in a verse by verse type of sermon, just kind of touching on things, I think what this is really, he's just referring to the fact that there are some people, because remember, what's the time frame from the days of John the Baptist even until now? So it wasn't a very long time frame. And he says, during that time frame, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Now, what is violence? It's when somebody violates another person, right? You know, it's a mugging. It's that kind of a thing where somebody is violated or something's done against, to them against their will. So he's saying the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And what I think he's referring to here is the fact, and if you would turn over to Luke chapter 11, is that some people during this time, and even today, this goes on, and has always been, they prevent others from entering the kingdom. That's how they're violating it. They're preventing other people from going in. They're taking it by force and not allowing others to go in. And we see another example of that. In Luke chapter 11, look at verse 50, 52. Jesus said, Woe unto you, lawyers. So here he is again calling somebody out, right, and, and rebuking them. For ye have taken away the key of knowledge, and ye, and ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. He's saying, look, there were people that were entering in, and you hindered them. People that were getting it, that were understanding the gospel, that were understanding who I am, and ye hindered them. Because we've got to remember, during Christ's ministry, he had enemies. I mean, he had people that the, the, the Jews and the Pharisees, they wanted to kill him. I mean, they took him out to a high, a high point on the hill. And they were going to cast him down and kill him. Multiple times they sought to kill him. You know, and, and he, there were times that Jesus wouldn't even walk among Jewry because they sought to kill him. So he had enemies, and I believe that's what he's referring to here, that these violent people were taking heaven by force from who? From other people. That's how they were violating others. They were not allowing others to enter in. So that's just kind of a... A surface interpretation is just something that I kind of thought of, how I kind of interpreted that. There's probably other ways, you know, you could listen to somebody else preach that and get a whole other meaning out of it. That just goes to show you how deep the Word of God is. Amen. But we'll go on here and, and just, um, 
you know, these following verses, if you go back to Matthew chapter 11, they kind of make the case for my point that, that they were by the violence, that the taking by force is then preventing others from coming in. Because it says there in Matthew in uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? I is like unto children sitting in markets and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous, and a winebibber, and a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Then he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. So you have people that were saying John had a devil and that and that Jesus had a devil, you know, that, that they just couldn't win. You know, they 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 were they lamented unto them and they didn't cry, you know, they piped on them, they did not dance. These these guys just weren't getting it. They didn't want to go along with it. And they were they, they were accusing him. They were saying he yeah, had the devil. And then so Jesus starts to upbraid of the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, verse twenty, because they repented not, verse twenty one, woe unto thee Chorazin, woe unto thee Bethsaida for if the mighty works which were done on you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So again, more of this hard preaching from Jesus, where he's just calling out entire cities by name and rebuking them. But I say unto you, it shall be more tiable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Now it really gets after Capernaum here in verse 23. And he says, And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. I mean, that's Jesus preaching. And Jesus got up and said, You're going to be brought down to hell. That's the type of preacher Jesus was. Amen. So, when, you know, when we go to the house of God, what for would he to see? You know, are we going to hear the word of God being preached the way it's, it's supposed to be? Or do we just want someone to tickle our ears and scratch our ears and, and, and tell us everything's okay? Well, that's not the type of preaching Jesus did. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom. Now, if we know anything about Sodom, that place was wicked. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I wrap my head around this thing, how is this even possible? Because... Sodom was just filled with reprobates, people that had just been rejected by God and given over. And it would have been remained until this day. I mean, that's, that's a harsh blow to Capernaum to say that Sodom would have done better off than you. But I say unto you that there shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. The only thing we can get from these passages is that there are different levels of judgment, that there are different degrees of punishment. And I don't, there are other verses we could turn to. I don't have in my notes, and you can't just turn them real quick here, but... I want to move along, but he says, look, that there should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom. Not saying Sodom's getting off the hook. It's just that it's going to be more tolerable for them. That they're going to have a lesser degree of punishment. There are greater degrees of punishment, I believe. You know, the servant that was that knew not his Lord's will shall be beaten with few stripes. But the servant who knew his Lord's will and did it not shall be beaten with many stripes. They're both beaten with stripes, just one to a more to a degree. So there are degrees of punishment. And really, what <clears throat> verses 11 through 24 are just kind of a, can kind of be summarized like this. We see in verse 11, you know, uh, verily I say unto you, among them are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus starts out, he's kind of validating John the Baptist in his ministry, saying, you know, th this is who John was. He validates him. And then he said, makes that statement about how there are men that are taking the kingdom of heaven by force and taking it from others or preventing others from going in, right? And then he kind of likens these people unto children in the market who, who don't respond appropriately. They don't respond to the message that's being given to them. You know, they're not hearing the gospel. They're not believing on Christ. And, uh, and, he, spite, and he cites, you know, specific example, examples there in verses 18 and 19. He says, look, John came unto you eating or drinking, and you said he had a devil. Right? And, like, and then he goes on and says in verse 19, but the Son of Man came eating and drinking. He was eating and drinking. And, and, and then you called him, you know, a friend of publicans and sinners. You called him a glutton and a wine bibber. So <clears throat> he's kind of just, you know, liking them un unto, you know, just people who are not, you can't win with these people. And he says, uh, and then verses 20 and 24 are just him basically rebuking them for these things. Rebuking them for not believing John the Baptist, for not believing on Christ. He rebukes them. But let's move along here, and I'll wrap this thing up here in verse 25. And it says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and it was revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. So it was good in the Father's sight to reveal these things unto babes and to hide them from the wise and prudent. 
And that's a, that's a really great verse, and that's something that uh, you know, shows us that God doesn't use the high and mighty to accomplish his will. You know, he doesn't use people, I mean, you would think there's people with just with far you know, superior intellects and just with all the money and resources that could just do great things with God, for God. They, you know, they could use their minds and their talents and their abilities and their money and their resources to accomplish great works for God on earth. Because, you know, great works for God require all those things. It takes money to rent a building and fill it with chairs and turn the lights on and have people come out and give them coffee and donuts and everything else, right? And that all takes money. And to print the tracks and to go out and encourage one another, that all takes, uh, uh, you know, resources. So, so why doesn't God use the high and mighty? Why doesn't God use the wealthy? Why doesn't God use these people? I mean, not saying he never can, but it's just not typically how you see God think, do things. Well, it's because, you know, he gets all the glory. He doesn't want to share glory with man. You know, it would be really easy for Bill Gates to say, yeah, I, I, I gave the gospel the whole world. You know, I, I printed the gospel and, and, and paid because he has billions of dollars. It would, it would be easy for him. But when God uses the babes, when God uses the meek and the lowly, we know it's God that's doing it, and it's done through his power. And if you would, uh, <clears throat> turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 26 where it says, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He's saying, look, you guys know that there's not a lot of well-to-do people. There's not a lot of mighty people, people with a lot of influence and ability in, in the society. Not many noble are called. You know, not, not a lot of nobility is there in the church. The mayor isn't sat down, you know. People who have a lot of influence. But God, what does it say in verse 27? God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world. Um, and the things which are despised hath God chosen. And, and things that are not to bring to not things that are. Why? Why does God use the base? Why does God use the lowly? Why does God use the foolish? Why does God use weak things in the world? Because <laughs> it, it says right here in verse 29 that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know, when a, when a small church does a big work, God gets all the glory. Amen. You know, this is a small yeah. church, but we got a big vision. You go around the corner over there, you'll see a map of Tucson. And we shade everywhere we knock doors and have, and, have, and have tried to give people the gospel. And the goal here is to shade that entire map in. Yeah. You know, in my lifetime, twice over, I mean, it's about a million people. You know, if, if you have a serious, dedicated people that are organized and, and serious about going out and doing the work, that can happen. And that is the goal. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, and we have to take ownership of where we are. But, you know, if, if we accomplish that, God's going to get the glory. Amen. Because we, we did it through him. We did it through the weak things of the world. You know, I'm not some mighty you know, orator that's going to get up and just inspire the throngs of Tucson to get right with God all on my own. It's going to take all of us, you know, as, as, as just plain, ordinary people in, just using what God has given us to be able to accomplish this goal. And we can say the same thing about the church, our, our church up in Phoenix, that are doing the exact same thing, knocking every door in Phoenix. That's getting done. And we're on track to finish that. And in the next few years, that will be done. Amen. That map is getting filled in. Those doors are being knocked. And uh, it just goes to show you, and when, those door, when that map's finally shaded in, when that map's finally shaded in, God's going to get the glory. You think we're going to stand around and go, yeah. Well, Good job, guys. I mean, we will say, hey, you know, I'm glad people were faithful. I'm glad people put forth the effort. But we'll all know that the only reason we even bothered to go do that is because we have a love for God and a love for the lost. And you will get all the glory for it. So that's why God uses the base things. That's why God decided to show these things unto babes. That's why Jesus thanked him for doing that. And he said, I thank thee, O Father, that thou hast hidden these things from the wise and prudent. And it goes on in Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 27, he says, All things are delivered me unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now, I have to kind of uh, kick this dog whenever I go by it because of the, this doctrine of the Trinity. And that's something that, quite frankly, it's surprising to some perhaps that even that this doctrine would ever even be called into question in a Baptist church. But we've seen that happen where people are starting to question the Trinity. 
and, and trying to you know, reinterpret what the, what the Trinity is or, or redefine it, saying that God is not three persons in one, but that he is one person in three different modes or whatever, whatever they try to think. It's something other than the traditional orthodox view of the Trinity that's been believed for thousands of years by Bible-believing Christians. Amen. And somehow they've got some new take on this. But what we see here, first of all, just one thing we can point out to kind of back up and shore us up on this doctrine of the Trinity is that there is a chain of command within it. He says, there all things are delivered unto me of my Father. So they had to be given unto him, right? So it means that if the Father had to deliver unto the Son, it means that the Son was then dependent upon the Father. You know, he was subject unto him. You know, that he had to have, he had to be obedient unto him. He had to subject himself to the Father. And I don't want to go on on that because I, like, I'm already over my time, but I do want to get, um, get through here. <clears throat> Another, he goes on and says uh, in verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What a great way to end a chapter. That's some of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Think about that. I mean, gee, we forget. Yeah, Jesus was a hard preacher, no doubt about it. I mean, he got up and said, You'll be brought down into hell. I mean, we're talking about for Sodom and for Tyre and Sidon and. You know, and he, and he called them out for their sin and all that. But let's not forget there was also, there was the gentle Jesus, too. There was the softer side as well, Amen. where he, you know, implored others to come unto him. You know, and, that, and it's, it's great because he shows us here how simple salvation is. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know, there's other religions and things like that. They can't say that. Their yoke is not easy. You know, you got to keep the sacraments, and you got to be baptized, and you got to repent of your sin, and you got to do this and do that and there's all these do's that you have to accomplish if you're going to get to heaven you have to work your way there you know think about with the hindus you have to be incarnate you know reincarnated multiple times and you can't eat beef i mean come on right <laughs> what kind of religion is that where you can't have a burger so that, that's hard that's not an easy that's not an easy yoke you know yeah. they want to put you in the yoke and, and get the cow out you know it's the other way around <laughs> but uh it's great verses. It just shows us that, you know, salvation is easy because it's not of works. That we, we, what you have believed, we do enter into rest. You know, we are entering into his rest when, when we believe and, and is, and through faith, when it is mixed with faith, what, that, that, uh, that we are entering into rest. Then we're not having to work our, our way uh, into heaven. And that Christ is meek and lowly. You know, he's somebody who can, uh, knows what it's like to be us. You know, he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, as that says in Hebrews 4. That he's meek and lowly, and that he can have compassion on us. You know, and he, can, and he knows our trials and the things that we go through. You know, and we, find fa we find rest in the fact that our souls are secure in Christ. You know, and uh, that the world will not always be as it is. You know, the world can, can take offense and can cause us to be offended and... But we have to understand that it's not always going to be that way. And then if we're saved, you know, we have that light yoke and we have that rest to come. And Jesus said in John 6, 16, 33, he said, These things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. You know, God wants us to have peace. Yeah. And he says, In the world you shall have tribulation. That's not to say that life isn't going to be without its, its, its difficulties. But he said, Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So when we have Christ, man, we really got something. We got something that's, that, the, that the world might, might never understand. But, uh, you know, we can understand that, and we can understand that, that uh, we have a God who understands what it's like to be us and, and cares and can have compassion on us because he's been as one of us. You know, he walked this earth just like you and I do. So that's, those are just great verses, you know, very comforting, something that, uh, just a great way to end a, a rather hard sermon on, on other points. But let's go ahead and...